Uh, thank you for staying with us on the program. We appreciate it. Let's uh, begin the discussion this morning uh, talking about the national uh, social investment uh, programs in Nigeria and uh, the impact they've made, uh, especially since 2016, when the different initiatives under the NSIP uh, were introduced by the federal government. A lot of persons have expressed uh, doubts and uh, misconceptions about these initiatives, no matter how well conceived they may have been. What exactly are the issues with uh, the NSIP and how can they be addressed? And then want to particularly look at how much it has reached the most vulnerable of Nigerians, particularly the demographics that have to do with uh, women, youth, and children. I'm joined by the Executive Director of African Network for Economic and Environmental Justice, Reverend David Ugolo. It's a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you very much. Uh, I know you have uh, taken out several years to follow issues about uh, uh, social investments, social initiatives, uh, on account of the kind of work that you do. When you look at what we have accomplished regarding uh, distribution of wealth in this country over time, even before the administration of President Muhammad Buhari that started in 2015, what's your assessment? It's okay. Um, you know, the resources is very limited. Again, thank you for the invitation. My I'm pleasure. happy to, uh, again, um, lend our voice to this very important issue, mm -hmm. but very silent in public policy space. Right. Obviously, um, as you know, um, different stakeholders are agitating for resources to be allocated in a way that will benefit them. Mm -hmm. And so the issue of social investment program is uh, the principle behind it is also to talk about the very poor and the vulnerable ones among us. And unfortunately, you know, these poor ones are not very organized mm. uh, in our own contest here. And because they are not very organized, their voice are not so very strong in the public space. And so the resources, in terms of resource allocation, I mean the budget yeah. at the national level mm -hmm. is very small compared to other uh, constituency. Um, so uh, obviously, uh, this is a big problem. And not just Nigeria, globally, mm -hmm. the issue of poverty. As a matter of fact, that's one of the uh, motivating factors around the issue of MDG, and the recent uh, is, uh, okay. SDG, so SDGs now, uh, Sustainable Development Group, right. all attempt to galvanize global political leadership and political will behind tackling the challenge of poverty. And so um, one key strategy countries around the world have adopted in tackling the challenge of poverty mm. is a um, social investment um, program. And so uh, Nigerian government buying into the idea and this and then decided to work closely with World Bank to initiate the National Social Safety uh, Net Program. And um, the World Bank have invested so much in it and the Nigerian government equally begin to allocate budget line for mm -hmm. social investment program. And so what you have seen, you have seen number of social investment program in the country. We have the conditional cash transfer, we have the own growth feeding programs, we have the ones also focusing on young mm -hmm. graduates. And power, and power and the Jeep, and Jeep initiative, and yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, these are various social, in, uh, uh, social safety net initiatives. Uh, I particularly am following the ca conditional cash transfer program, mm. obviously because of its link to the grand corruption issues where uh, stolen assets stashed in Western banks are returned back to Nigeria. Right. And the Nigerian government uh, enter into an agreement with the Swiss government to plug in the $322.5 million into the conditional cash transfer program. You, you see, uh, Nigeria is dealing with a lot when it comes to dealing with, I mean, addressing poverty. Uh, we're told that at least a uh, hundred million Nigerians cannot, uh, for want of better words, lift their heads above the poverty line. Mm. Is it realistic to say we are fighting poverty real time in this country? Well, if you look at population, for example, mm. um, is um, is the rate at which the population is growing compared to the the investment in tackling the poverty? I would say no. And like I said, <laughs> um, the politics of tackling poverty is mm. a huge one. And obviously, um, one vehicle to raise the profile of the fight against poverty could have been through the political parties. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, as you have seen in the country, um, the political parties are really, really not um, pursuing um, um, tackling poverty agenda mm -hmm. in a more systemic and institutionalized way. 
and this obviously um, um, and the, the fact that we can play with data in the country mm -hmm. and there's no actual data to really say which government or which political party is tackling poverty become more even more uh, problematic but however the danger is that um, there's a boomerang if you mm -hmm. don't tackle um, right. poverty we all pay price for it, even the very rich and even the political elite, they all pay price for it. Um, poverty feeds into the violence we see in the society. Mm -hmm. and poverty feeds in into a number of uh, development challenges that we are facing in the country. Uh, um, armed robbery, kidnapping, assassination, all these kind of things that bring threats that don't encourage foreign investment to come into the country are all connected, correlated with the issue of poverty mm. because once the young men and women who are growing don't have the opportunity to go into the school and to be well trained they will have a deficit in human capital and once you have a deficit of human capital you can't talk about development particularly right. in this service driven mm. uh, century mm -hmm. um, um, we no longer, uh, not necessarily because you have a natural resources, you'll be able to compete in this current economy. Um, in the service-driven economy, you need the human capital. And unfortunately, a poor household will not be able to uh, sustain that. And the implication is that you have more and more people who are uh, now vulnerable. Mm. And because of this, uh, it, it does affect the economy. Even if you want to even bring industry, you bring investment into the country, where will you get the right people? I, I'm going to tell you something quickly. You, you, you made uh, allusion to the politics of uh, fighting poverty just a while ago. Yes. There, there are experts like yourself who have theorized about how that poverty is um, business in itself. How is that element playing out across the globe and including Nigeria? Uh, well, um, you, yes, definitely, because obviously if you look, um, if you do a kind of analysis of the campaigns of political party, mm. they play with with, with the choice of, oh, we are going to fight poverty, right. we're going to tackle poverty, but they are the underlying factors that are the driver for poverty. Nobody talks about it. Mm. For example, in the case of Nigeria, it, what is the underlying factor that drives poverty in Nigeria? It's corruption. Right. So in fighting, in fighting, in fighting corruption, you will address poverty, and how mm. do that happen? Um, and who is involved in corruption in Nigeria? Is the political elite. And if you look even program targeting for poverty fighting in the country, are jacked by the political elite. If you, if, you, if you review, one of the reasons why the federal government decided to come up with the National Social Safety Net Program was as a result of a study carried out by World Bank reviewing all past social safety net program in right. the country and when they reviewed they found out that because of lack of uh, coordination policy uh, challenge and all that um, most of the uh, uh, social safety net program initiated in the then uh, government on mm. under uh, president jonathan did not work because obviously if you recall during the fight against um, oil subsidy remover the federal government under the presidency of Jonathan then did uh, uh, make commitment that the savings from that um, oil subsidy uh, um, remover will be used for social safety net. Uh, um, and then um, the um, uh, people expect gave a chance to the government. But what happened? When the money was invested in a, uh, in a program, um, I can't really recall now, mm. but it's one of those social safety net programs. Yeah. And, and, and politicians were asked to coordinate it across the country. What happened? Mm. It was purely abused. So that's why I said the politics of, yes, you can, I completely agree with you if you theorize it to say that uh, tackling poverty could be politics. And because you can easily draw the correlation that a politician actually genuinely committed in fighting corruption. Mm -hmm. Then, if you look at the underlying factor that is responsible for corruption in Nigeria, take our Niger Delta region, for instance. Government found that, that there is a development challenge arising from the oil and gas exploration in the country. Right. On the basis of that, the government decided to come up with the issue of development intervention to address some of the after effect of oil exploration, which is NDDC. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I have seen what has happened in the last five, seven years, and just recently, what is happening in NDDC. The news that is coming out from NDDC, what does it show to you? And under which political party, under which government is this happening? Mm. And it's not just about this current government. I'm talking, it spans 
pre, even before this so government. So there's a history to it. There's a history. Mm. So you can use this as an evidence to actually say that the elite, the political elite, are actually playing with the fight against poverty. Because obviously, the elite are the ones that are involved in corruption. Mm. These billions of naira that are supposed to be going, have you of recent tried to move from Benin to worry? Those days, about five or ten years ago, you go to worry and return back in less than two hours. But what has happened? Just a you spend three, five, ten hours. And I'm even shocked that with the situation of the road between and the, the, the most important road that connect the economy of Edo and Delta is Bini Wari Road. Right. And if this if the two governors, a Do state governor and a Delta state governor, are genuinely committed to fighting poverty, when you see what happened in this road in the last two, three months, any genuinely political leader, they will rise up to the challenge. But what has happened? The Delta state governor, a Do state governor, they are busy involving politics. So there's also the issue so of misalignment of, of, of priorities. Exactly. Mm. It doesn't concern them. I, I, I can't remember when Governor Baseki ever tried to take that road or Governor uh, Okua ever take that road. I can't remember. Their family don't pass there. Their family are based overseas. They are not here. So you and I and the poor in the society are faced with this reality. How about the argument that it's a federal road? We've heard that time and again. Oh my God. Does, does, does it hold true? Have you not seen governors in the Southeast coming together to mobilize? It, Buhari is not here. It is a do people. It is Delta State people that are suffering. That road is the engine of the economy mm. of Bender State. Right. And so any reasonable politician that is reasonable, that is genuinely committed to the plight of the people, will never allow that to happen. But Governor Kua and Governor Obaseki have refused. You can imagine if Governor Kua and Governor Obaseki addresses a press conference On that and, say, and say that my people, our people from Bendel, are under immense suffering because it's unimaginable. And if you know the amount of resources that is going down the drain, for example, you see a, a lot of, of trucks of petrol mm -hmm. fell the last time when it fell, the thing caught fire and over over four or five people died instantly. And if you see the economic damage and lose that the country is facing as a result of that bad road, it tells you that is an evidence of how the political elite, it's not about any political party, mm. because we have to be very cautious because right. we're in a political time in Edo State. It's not about, it, and this cut across, at the federal level is APC, at the Edo State level is PDP. So you can see that it's not about party, mm -hmm. it's about a political elite that are not serious, that are not really particularly interested in tackling the challenge of poverty. And I've just used, so the, the Bini Wari Road, which we call the East-West Road, is, a, is an example to illustrate how political party has failed in Nigeria, mm. how political elite has failed in Nigeria, and how they have refused to tackle the challenge of poverty. When, when the pandemic, I mean the COVID-19 pandemic broke out and Nigeria uh, started feeling the heat, a lot of persons felt, well, this is probably the best time ever uh, that uh, this country, governments in this country will uh, take full advantage of social investment programs to help people who would not be able to go to work, be able to do their everyday business to earn a living for themselves and their families. D did we do well, or have we done well so far with all of these initiatives as far as the pandemic is concerned? Because at the point, states had locked down. At another point, we had a situation where Lagos State, for example, the economic hub of this country, uh, had a situation where people were not allowed to leave their homes, for instance. How much did we take advantage of uh, these initiatives? Um, I, I'm happy, um, again, this question is very interesting because um, I have been involved in, in the old monitoring across mm -hmm. the entire country. I have deployed over 700 uh, top civil sites across the country, monitoring the old so-called um, 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 COVID-19 palliative. Uh, what really happened at the federal level was that um, the 
$322.5 million that Abasha stole kept in Switzerland that was returned to Nigeria was actually one of those resources that was still being disbursed across the country. Hmm. So in between January to April, it hasn't been disbursed so, and COVID-19 happened. So when the president gave a directive that um, palliative should be given to the poor and the vulnerable, uh, well, the government never had any institutional framework on how that should be done. Hmm. So the best um, possible bet for the then federal uh, minister for humanitarian was to rely on the conditional cash transfer program. Okay. And so they gave a directive to NCTU, the National Cash Transfer Office, that is designed to implement the cash transfer program. And so the informants uh, was given to people. But as you know, the, the Nigerian social register where the National Cash Transfer Office is mined their data from only have about 2.6 million poor Nigerians. Mm. And so, um, and then the targeting was just those focus. But you have millions of Nigerians who, are, who have not been captured. I, I have not been captured because mm. either the state government have not provided the, uh, the architectural framework that will enable uh, NASCO, mm. uh, that's the uh, National uh, Social Safety Net uh, Coordinating Office, to roll in all the strategic way to identify who is poor and that, and then enroll them into the, uh, the National Social Register. Then this is the challenge. And so it's only those few people, and mostly not, almost 80 percent of it were from the north part of the country. Mm. So the vulnerable ones and the poor ones from the south, south from the southeast were not really captured apart from few states like Anabra. As we speak, like those states poor are not benefiting for the last. That's why I told you that these guys are not really concerned about the poor. In a do and debt as we speak, other states in the northern part of the country benefited that four months that the president ordered. Do you know that in data and in Edo, the poor people have not benefited in the past five, six, seven months. They have not. So how do you now rate the political leadership of these two states? How do you rate them when it comes to poverty tax? So with, with so, whom do we domicile this problem? Is it with the governors of these states? Look at, well, if the governor raises it mm. out, if, for example, Governor Kua and Governor Baseki decided to raise their voice and say, our very poor people, I am saying that this is a program announced, designed for their door and data, the very poor, oh. to benefit. Right. As we speak now, the very poor people of a door state identify across the three senators. It's not, it has nothing to do with political party, either PDP or APC. I'm only trying to provide you an evidence oh. that the political elite in this country, they are trading with the poor, unfortunately. And this is the evidence. I say it's not about the poor. Otherwise, why should Governor Kua and Governor Obaseki not raise their voice to say that why will people in Nasarawa, why will people in ben 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 Benway, why will people in Kano and Kaduna, their counterparts, the poor in those places are receiving money. Even in Lagos just recently, why will the poor in Edo State not receive money? We have deployed people to go across Edo State, meeting these poor people from the Edo North, Edo Central, Edo South. I am shocked the data that is coming out. And I hope that this, we're going to release the report very short, shortly. And that will really tell you, are the politics really interested in fighting poverty? They are not. From the, from the charge that you, you've established now, it's, it's obvious that there, there's uh, little or no sincerity in the entire process ultimately. But, but then, again, then, then again, people questioned the rationale behind handing out cash uh, as against using other channels, maybe electronic channels, for example, to push this uh, financial assistance to uh, the it's beneficiaries. About, it's about, it's about um, it's also, it's, this is a really big challenge. It's about mm. the um, uh, issue of data. Yes. How do you capture people's identity? Mm. If you know the amount of investment government has put in at the federal level in trying to capture the identity, you know, this national ID card. Right. But it's fraudulent because, you know, the political elite in Nigeria are taking advantage of the absence of really proper, transparent data to perpetuate corruption. And even, you will be shocked, even in the university. If you tell a vice chancellor of a university that what is the population of this university, you will be sure that the vice chancellor will not be able to tell you. And why? It is not because they are not able, because it's a simple thing to do, but the, the fraud and corruption lies behind those things. And the same thing in the country. Why will a country, and if you don't have the actual data, can you plan? Mm. You can't plan. It's just like an ITV, for example. ITV is a private investment. 
If ITV don't know their staff, would they know the amount of money that they pay for staff? How will the management plan? That's what happened to the country. So we live in a country we don't know our population. We live in a country we don't have a data of the poor. And so when government allocates money, like we just heard now that the National Social Registry has now been scaled up now to four million. Hmm. It took the Nigerian government almost three, four, five years to build the, the database of the social register from zero to 2.6 million. But in less than a year, they have now built it to four million. And we are currently auditing the process. How come about it? How do they capture the data? So there is a policy. So when you say there is a policy behind tackling poverty, this way it comes. But however, why this politics is going on in Nigeria? Because when you have a political elite that have lived too long on rent, you know, we are, this is the pain we have to pay. Mm. And that has the oil cost political economy referred to. When you say oil cost, when you, when you have a set of political elite, they don't have anything to offer the society. The only thing you see in a political elite, either a former governor or a former member of National Assembly, with a, a massive word, and you ask yourself, how come about this word? You cannot see any intellectual reason why this very political fellow or a council or a chairman suddenly in a, in a, a amount of word that you cannot explain. Hmm. And so, because of rent, they collect rent. And when they collect rent, what do they use it for? They don't use it for anything reasonable. That's why you see, if you look from the 60s to present day, just look the history of politicians and their family. Because when you're wet, no matter how wealthy you are, this is actually the irony of the whole thing. So if you are a politician, if you steal too much money, you destroy your family. Because your children can't grow well. When a child grow in a family where the source of income is not based on intellectual, it's not based on any industry, mm. but it is just based on because the father is a counselor or because the father is a chairman, that child is ruined forever. Because in the first place, politicians who make money from politics, collect rent from politics, they, they, don't, they don't have industry. They don't think. They are not intellectuals. They collect rent. That's how they massively amass wealth. And the children now live on an inflated wealth, ego. And obviously, the children behave as enrichment children. And so when you look back, and in, in the study we are carrying out now, we have found out that children of politicians from the 60s to this date, the way don't go to the next generation. Go back. That, 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 that's quite a serious issue, I, I, I mean, quite frankly. <laughs> because but, they live on rent. Yeah, yes, but, 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 but you see, there are many personal issues around poverty yes. and all of the uh, social investment uh, schemes that we have seen in this country so far. The government of today is proud of what it has done. Which, Basically, which the government? Now, when you I mean, the private government, the private uh, government, for example, the government? is part of what it has done. I mean, yes. you go to the website of the NSIP, for yes. example, you There's see all, no of, the, yes, all of the no great things that they've done. Yes, yes. yes. But, no but, but then the everyday Nigerian, for example, the young man uh, walking the street this morning, the woman selling somewhere around a Daiken market or New Benin intersection, uh, maybe around Mission Road or something is wondering whether it will ever trickle down to them. So real-time impact is a challenge. But I want us to talk about accountability uh, as far as all of these uh, revenues are concerned. You and I have taken out the last few minutes talking about resources, for example. We understand that today, for instance, the House of Representatives is taking a look at the last three years between 2016 and 2019. Yes. What has the federal government done, particularly with the over one trillion, well over one trillion, spent on these social investment programs? All right, so that already raises a lot of issues. We've seen several probes of that same nature in this country, including the NDDC probe that you talked about. Yeah, the, the uh, National uh, Assembly is just trying to also commence yes. another probe. Are we not just spinning around the circus? That's the politics you talk about. Mm. You see, and it's also part of the characteristics of an oil cost country. And we have also seen that studies have been carried out that all countries where natural resources is the major source of income. The issue of corruption and where there's a patron client culture, you know, this patronage culture, mm -hmm. there is always this problem. So Nigeria is not an exception. As a matter of fact, Nigeria is a classical case study for oil cost country. And so the issue of corruption is massive. And if you look at the kind of corruption that happens in all this intervention, it's as a result associated with rent collection. Even the National Assembly that is supposed to be playing an oversight role, they want to be a gatekeeper in everything about Nigerians. As a matter of fact, of recent, one of the most interesting aspects of this challenge is National Assembly wanted to decide who is poor in their constituency. Mm. That was really the whole fight between National Assembly and the executive. 
They want to decide. Even though the federal government have put in place a World Bank framework mm. to identify, because there are three strategic ways that they have come up with getting people enrolled into the National Social Register. Right. But if you look, Shopee, yes, I remember now. The previous government under President Buhari, uh, mm, oh, Jonathan, Shopee. it was Shopee. Mm. And under Shopee program, what happened? Why did it fail? Shopping program was put under politicians. And naturally, politicians, when they want to allocate opportunity for the poor, it is their constituency, it is their member. But what Buhari government did in improving on Shopee was to again work with the World Bank. And the World Bank has a framework, a globally recognized strategy. And one of them is geographical targeting. Another one is community-based targeting. And then the other third one was posing tests. Mm. They use this scientific framework to identify poor. And the poor, they play a role. For identifying a poor household, you have to lose this scientific framework. That's how the social register came up. And it was from the social register that the NCTO, the National Cash Transfer Office, that is implementing the conditional cash transfer for the poor across the country, mined their data from. So it wasn't from any politician. So PDP or APC couldn't influence whose name appears in that register. Mm. But because some politicians couldn't influence that, some governors couldn't influence that, they became not interested. And that's why you found out that the Northerners, the Northern governors, who invested in it are the one currently benefiting 80% of Abasha money that was returned. And the Abasha money that was returned, $322.5 million, which was supposed to be spread across the country. The northern, the northern part of the country is getting 60 to 70%. Why, 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 why do we have that kind of development? Because at those state, for example, do you know that for the past four months or five months, at those state, poor people have not been receiving money? Why? It is not because of the fault of the poor people. Their name is in this register. But what has happened? The government claimed that the, 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 the company that they recruited to deploy to disburse this money mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is incompetent. So should you now... So this government was outsourced. <laughs> oh my God. So can you, now, can you see how a federal government could make a joke of their own policy? If you, you, you put in place a World Bank procurement framework, you recruited an incompetent company. The hasn't got the capacity to do what they claim to be doing. And there was a panel who reviewed that procurement process. As we speak now, the poor people in Edo, in Igobazua, in the Edo North, in Isha, they are feeling very bad. And that's what led us to the issue of trust. Do people trust government? Why do you think the people, these poor people in Edo State, they have been receiving cash transfer program? So at least in January, they have not been receiving. Why would they trust either Governor Baseki or the APC government at the federal level. Why? So people should be careful. It's not about APC. It's not about PDP. It's a corrupt political elite. So again, it comes to a systemic problem. Exactly. Well. We're going to start taking calls in a bit so uh, everyone watching now can have a chance to lend their voice to this discussion we're having uh, because this is not just about four people. It's about how we lift each other up in this country. It's about exactly. how government plays its role to ensure that no one is left behind exactly. economically and socially. We are putting that number on the screen for you so you can uh, put your calls through and be sure you're part of this uh, program. Uh, but just be sure you stay on the issues, please. Uh, we're not discussing exactly. Edo State politics today. Exactly. We're not discussing <laughs> Governor Baseki. We're not discussing no, 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 no. Zayam. We're not discussing Comrade Adams or Shomale. Exactly. We're not discussing partisanship exactly. or elections. <laughs> we're talking real life issues now. Issues, exactly. Please, so yeah, stay on course. Don't throw tantrums. <laughs> don't cast aspersions, please. And please don't also say things that you cannot say substantiate. Exactly. Let's stay with the facts. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have you on the program, yes. Reverend Golo. But, but I also think we should talk about um, a very ugly incident that took place recently, which caused us embarrassment both home and abroad, yes. when um, some beneficiaries of NPAR went protesting in the country's capital. What, what, what's the import of that? It's also, the, you know, I, first, I, I, you know, political economists refer to this kind of situation we found ourselves mm. as I, oil cost. Oil okay. cost. Mm. You know, the oil is supposed to be a blessing. Other countries like uh, UMA, Mm -hmm. They have used their all year to transform their society. Norway, the last time I visited Norway, I was shocked. The amount of resources they've put for their future generation. They have been able to take their all year to invest in all different kind of industry around the world. Mm -hmm. That even children yet unborn in Norway will never be poor again. The same thing in Scotland. The same thing in Canada. 
in the oil producing aspect right. of Canada. Mm. Now, countries, Botswana, they have also used their natural resources Which to invest. Which is an African country. An African country. Mm. is a, 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 an excellent example of a success story, how you can use your oil revenue to better the future of future generations and invest it in human capital. Because the, what the world depends on today is not natural resources. Israel has no natural resources. But they are the best startup. You, millions of startup that is producing wonderful things around the world today come from Israel. Right. Look, Switzerland, they have no natural resources. But look, with their banking industry, they are placed, the human development is high. But in the case of Nigeria, with the oil, with everything, look what we, have, we found ourselves. Let, let's start and so this is the reason that because our political lead, lead on life, mm. that's why these people that left abroad, even they have turned it to become corruption opportunity to enrich themselves. Okay, let's uh, take a few calls quickly. Hello, good morning. He Hello, good morning. Welcome to the program. Okay, I, I think we, we lost that one. Please just keep those calls coming and uh, let's stay with the issues. Hello, good morning. Yeah, good to have you on the program. Your name and location, quickly. My name is Sonny. All right, Sonny, good to have you on the show. Reverend David, good morning. Good morning, sir. I remember I told you that uh, please continue to do what you are doing. Thank you, sir. And uh, you have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly in the course of doing this job. As somebody like me, I've been privileged to have followed you for a very long time. Like we were sharing yesterday, you have always talked about the powerful individuals instead of powerful institutions. And as long as we continue like this, we are going to have problems. For example, I shared my thoughts with, uh, I think, the manager news about my experience with uh, the Canadian government. He talks about what you were talking about in Nicoba Zuwa, how they can trust leadership. For example, we want a situation. If you look at ITV, for example, you don't even know that if you don't tell you that if you don't know. Because they have already put the station in a system that it can run itself without being influenced by anybody. And if you look at the reportage now concerning this uh, election, you will see the way they have been trying to ensure that they fit every jingle and every every reportage that comes through the station. But can we find the same with uh, EDS that is a state government run station? And if you look at what you have been capable for, over time somebody will think that you belong to party or party D, but you are constantly trained on the part of righteousness and on the part of truth, and which we need. Because if we have a, 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 an institution, whether President Buhari is aware or not, the institution will fight corruption. Exactly. When we have an institution, whether the number of continue or not continue, Everything that already put the place for the city to enjoy, they will continue to enjoy it. Exactly. This is the kind of institution exactly. we want to see. We don't exactly. want to be powerful individual instead of powerful institution. Thank you, good morning. All right, thank, thank you, Sonny, uh, for that contribution. Let's take uh, one more call and then we'll bring uh, Reverend uh, Golo back into the conversation. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, I'm sure uh, that is uh, network being nasty uh, this morning. Let's uh, just uh, take this one quickly. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Okay, uh, I, I wouldn't know whether you called Philip, but uh, this is TMI, and uh, we're talking about uh, how to deal with poverty in Nigeria. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Welcome to TMI. Please turn down the audio on your television. All right, Vice Kenneth, please turn down the audio on your television, please. Thank you. Uh, you're calling from Benin, I guess. I'm calling from Benin City. Okay, make your point quickly. Yeah. I feel that the system of most African countries are both. The system itself helps corruption. Until the system is changed, it doesn't matter the individual who tries to enter into any political position, it will still not get issued. So we have to start thinking of changing the system mm. before we can change or bring it on around. Thank you. That's my contribution. All right, thank you. We're going to take a few more calls, everyone. But let's uh, uh, get... Uh Reverend God also react to some of these issues. I, I read people say we, we, we got it wrong from independence, but uh, we, we can't go back to our past now. Then others would say we, we have to recalibrate the Nigerian system. How do we accomplish that? Well, I think the bottom line is that mm. um, the first caller 
really <laughs> nailed the point. Right. It's about institution, mm -hmm. not about individual. So once the institutions are right, then individuals can operate and then you can have the goal achieved. What has happened is that the institutions that are supposed to help strengthen democratic values have been compromised. For example, political party. In any democratic society, mm -hmm. political party plays a major role. Then if you look, but if the political party must play that major role, it has to be people-driven political party. Right. But what we have in Nigeria today, PDP, APC, are owned by individuals. Owned? Yes, they are owned. They are like, I call them, uh, it's, it's like, you know, it's like, it's like they are trader platform. They are not really platform for people. Would that be because they, they are said to lack ideologies? Or no, it's not about ideologies. It's about the, when it's like a building. When a building does have the right foundation, what happens? It cracks. And that's how the political party is. They don't have the right foundation. So you can see that in each of all these political, you see, they naturally just give big names. Either you are a party leader or you are this, that are not even in the concern of the party. And none of these political parties, both PDP and APC, have a validated party member register. So it is only when it is covenant for the big man, when he wants to contest election, he brings out a list of party members. Otherwise, individual will not be able to influence who becomes a governorship candidate. Oh. But because the political parties are in the hands of the rich in the party, then the people don't really matter who emerges as their candidate, either as a councillor or as a chairman or as anything. So because, and this as a result of how Nigerian economy is run is a, is a major characteristic of all year uh, naturally, natural resource driven country. And if you go to other countries where you see oil, particularly in developing country, all this is associated with them. But few countries in this country have made an exception by making sure that rules work. So when the political party refuses to play their role, their major role, because they stand for values and ideology. But can you say that for Nigeria? Not at all. How will you say, for example, political party operates in Niger Delta? Have you, no, maybe you have not gone to Pataki Court of Recent. The pain and tears can only tell you that we don't have a political elite in the region. So it is not about PDP, it's not about APC. You just have a failed political elite who take an advantage of the poor of this country. And, but you know there is time for everything. Nothing goes up that doesn't come down. This decade we are going through will come to an end one day. Some people want to say revolution. I, don't, I am not a promoter of revolution. Because see what has happened in Tunisia. Uh -huh. I don't believe that you have to crash the system and recalibrate. No! Certain things will emerge. And that's why watching the, the political system, what should be the agenda to tackle poverty? So that we can bring this discussion right. to a really proper perspective. Uh -huh. How do we promote poverty? is for government to allocate resources that will benefit the poor people. And in this current development paradigm, all year, natural resources no longer play a major role. Countries that run the world now, for example, if you look the, 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 the capital base of Facebook, oh. Amazon, and which other one again? Um, 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 Apple, for example. Apple, for example. Twitter. Uh, Twitter. Oh. These four companies alone, their they are total capital base it's more than Africa as a continent. As a continent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. These are just companies. Mm -hmm. Even Facebook, the total depth of Nigeria, how much it is? Facebook can afford to write it off. They don't have natural resources. What they have? So what it means is that the, the future is about data. The future is about how government can position their country by investing in the human resources. And how do you invest? Education the earth sector. You see what has happened, how Nigeria was exposed as an embarrassing country when COVID-19 crisis happened. Mm. The, as we speak today, just even the data, people don't trust it. That tells you the kind of government we are having in the country. So this, this challenge, how do we address it, is for critical voice, civil society, key traditional rulers. Unfortunately, all these key institutions have also been compromised. Mm. Including the civil society. It's exactly. Mm. I can tell you that. Um, we are not exception. Right. But in moving forward, it is not about lamenting. It's about how can we reposition this country for us to have the benefit. And that's where the issue of stopping impunity. For example, you can see what has happened in NDDC. Mm -hmm. uh, our challenge has always been, what is happening in NDDC because we have a weak leadership at the federal level. And President Buhari must take responsibility. All the corruption you are seeing in NDDC is because we have a weak president. 
we 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 cannot. Uh, we no, cannot well, no, let, let me tell you. Let me. We can't slice our president no, on a live program such as this. If, no, no. If you're saying no. the president and the government would have to do more, it, it's. Oh, you see, you see, you see. But when you say the president is weak. If the president is a man who has done five years and counting in office. No, you see, uh, yes. that's something. Like, I'm, I'm so a, please, you have to apologize for that. I no, I kept no. It, it, it was an it was an overreach. No, 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 no. Excuse you me. You have to take it. You cannot you cannot slide the president on, on the. Board. No, it's not about it's about it's about assessing the president role yes. in something that has happened. And then we have, we have to stay with a level of politeness while we do that assessment. No, 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 no. Let me explain. When you say weak, yes. How do you address? How do you when you're do, you you you're from social science? Mm. How do you assess leadership? How do you, what language would you use? Is that, that's not, a, no. But no, you were no, talking, I speaking you. to the president of the president. No, excuse me, I said. not the system he runs. Can I say something? NDDC Act, mm. the president is responsible for the appointment. There was a process in this country. A board was constituted. These board members were taken to the National Assembly. It was approved. The president overruled that. And came up with an interim body. Did you know his reasons for the? No, that's what, I, I'm, I'm doing the analysis now. Mm -hmm. This is a political economy analysis yes, of an right. institution that have failed. And then I want you to tell me which words do you use to assess when leadership of a country fail to take responsibility to address corruption and governance? It's either strong leadership or weak leadership. And the word I have used is weak. It doesn't abuse. Yeah, and, you, and, you, and you are not talking about the system. You are talking about the person of the I president. am talking about the role of the president in relation mm. to NDDC. Okay. I said the president by now should have taken a decision to so address. You are categorically saying the president is weak. You are saying the his system. Action is towards, his action towards NDDC okay. is weak because and that's why we are suffering in the region. Okay. So we could have done better with the NDDC. Exactly. Mm. And there's no better word to use to address a leader who failed to take responsibility. We shouldn't paint. When something is black, you say it's black. When it is white, you say it's white. When the president is doing well in tackling grand corruption from abroad, I am one of his apostles. I am one of those who have praised the Buhari that he has done very well in ensuring that Nigeria return as stolen asset. But in areas of policy, for example, the Niger Delta are responsible for driving the economy of this country. But the suffering that our people is undergoing is unimaginable. It's only when you go to Olopo, you will see the suffering of the people. I was just going to ask you something along the same line, because you talked about uh, a few countries, the UAE, for example. You even talked about Botswana, which is even closer to home. Yes. Would Nigeria be better off without oil, realistically speaking? There's, look, you see, it is the human beings that have abused the God blessing. Mm -hmm. Their country, and I've cited countries where oil was discovered, and they use it well. No is one. And I didn't go far away north. I came back to Africa. Botswana has the natural resources. They use it well. It's about the individuals. It's about the people. The political elite has failed. They come again to the region, right. the Niger Delta region. Who are the people mining NDDC? Who, who appoints them? How do you become MD of NDDC? You see, we have a presidential system we practice in this country. We have a strong president. If things will work, you need a strong president that will make things work with all the other oversight bodies playing their role. But what has happened is that there has been a, I don't know the word to you. Can you give me a word to describe where we found ourselves? Maybe after the show ends. Huh? After because, the show no, ends. because our audience are listening. Mm. Because the way you presented the issue a while ago, mm. I, I, don't, I, was I, saying, I was saying, uh, you can have the discussion, uh, you do an assessment of the president you, and no, his actions. How do you assess it? And, and that you have quite him. No, oh, why would I do that? Yes. I'm a public figure for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. I'll be speaking on national, international events. I, I cannot do that. I cannot. But what I'm saying is that if the president is performing, right. you use the word to describe his performance. Mm -hmm. The performance of the presidency in NDDC today, as we speak today, is not very encouraging. Okay. People are not happy. And when you go to the Niger Delta today, people are suffering. We are suffering. So it is better to communicate this suffering to the president. And the president intervened at a point. He sends the vice president. And I was in that town hall meeting when Osimbaji visited the region. He does the government convene the town hall meeting. And there were quite a number of recommendations that came up from that town hall meeting. Mm -hmm. From, we are running into about two, three years now. What has happened? What has happened? So how do you describe that performance? I am saying, because ultimately, let us not shift away from where we are going. Right. We are saying the politics of fighting poverty. 
And I was trying to tell you that from my first initial analysis, mm -hmm. that it has nothing to do with political party. It has nothing to do with any tribe. It has nothing to do with anything. It's just that the political elite, irrespective of their political agenda, their interest is driven because of the corrupt uh, shown they are involved in. Mm -hmm. For example, an example, you have seen what has happened in NDDC. You saw the show of shame in the National Assembly when the IMSC people went for public hearing and investigation. Yeah. Now, forensic audit was ordered by the president. And all this put in place with the situation we found in the Niger Delta by just going through the east-west road. Are you a happy person? How do you describe such situation? Billions of Nigeria that have come into the Niger Delta, the Red Commission, to use for building roads, infrastructure, so that they, they will become nests in the region, so that there will be development in the region. Things are not working. When the president was contesting election for him to be re-elected, there are three key things he identified as his area of focus. One, the issue of conflict, particularly referring to insecurity. the North insecurity in the right, country. Right. The issue of what? Corruption mm -hmm. and the, the economy. Mm -hmm. Now, when you do analysis on these three issues, on the, on the issue of conflict, you will give it to the president that to a large extent, you can see the Niger data crisis has come to zero. Yeah. If you look at the Northeast, tackling Boko Haram, the president has done excellently well to the best of his Even knowledge. They have a yeah, lot of work exactly, do, because right? it, the issue of Boko Haram in the Northeast is beyond Nigeria. It's an international uh, conflict issue. And so the president, to the best of his knowledge and resources, he has tried. He has given leadership to that. Then it comes to the issue of the economy. The unemployment level in the country today is embarrassing. Even though government will not provide us data, the economy today is in a bad situation. Bad situation in the sense that the macroeconomic indices are not very friendly. But even though with those challenges, we can also give it to the president for some level of stability. For example, the issue of where supply across the country is done very well. And so because of that, we give him some good performance he has done that way. But come to the issue of corruption, which has a capacity to undermine those two other agenda, either the conflict, the security agenda, or the economy, or the economy agenda. Mm -hmm. How will you rate the president? And the best way to rate the president, let's look to the TI Corruption Perception Index. Mm -hmm. Since the president came on board, has there been any improvement on the Corruption Perception Index? And then we'll go back to Basel Anti-Money Laundry Index, where they rate issue of anti-money laundry. Do you see the country performing very well? No. These are not index produced by Anage or produced by David Ogolo. These are international rating standard that government subscribes to. Mm. And if you are a government that wants to improve the metrics of your governance, you must always reflect on those reports when they come out. As Nigerians perform very well? No. And then you and I just having a perception of how government is performing in things. Do you think the story that is coming out from NDDC will make us to now use a word that will not demonstrate where the president is standing? So government, the presidency performance in, in relation to NDDC is not very encouraging. And the people that have been named and shamed so far are on both political party. They are from PDP and they are from APC. We have corrupt political elite from both political party. Now, because a president who sworn to fight corruption, because corruption is the underlying factor of the reason why social investment program was, in, was, in, uh, was implemented in Nigeria in the, and the, in the first place. Now, corruption is an underlying problem. Can you say that the way we are suffering in this country today, look what is happening in AFCC. Is that a good thing? It's not me. It's not me. How do you now rate the president on this? As an anti-corruption expert and activist for over 30 years, I can tell you that the president's performance is not very encouraging. Mm -hmm. If I can use a, a, a more conservative word to describe how the president performs in relation to corruption. But however, a general way to improve on this, there are ways. When president set up committee, should follow it through. When he set up system for investigation, he should follow it through. When President sees systems, institutions are put in place, he should not undermine it like he did in NDDC. There, there's an issue I want you to react to quickly. Yes. Uh, in fairness to fact, Nigeria mm -hmm. has enjoyed tremendous um, partnership as far as uh, social investment programs are concerned, mm -hmm. including from Brentwood institutions mm -hmm. like um, the World Bank, yes. for example. Mm -hmm. when, when those institutions look at our performance today in, in relation to tackling poverty, are they impressed? Do they see future with us in terms of partnership? At the World Poverty Map mm. show that Nigeria uh, has the highest poorest people around the world. Mm. That was data that was coming out from the World Poverty Map. 
And that for me is something that we, you see, some of these analysis we are doing, there are two different analytical point of view. Apart from the fact that we are an activist articulating, advocating for a change policy that will impact on the people, we have also gone to school to read. For example, on the corruption issue, I have my master's degree from one of the best universities in the world on corruption and governance from University of Sussex. I am not just talking as an anti-corruption activist, as an expert. I read it in the university, one of the best universities in the world. And I run one of the leading NGO working on corruption in Nigeria for the past 25 years. So I can tell you when things are going well, when things are not going well. So what will government do? When government listen to this kind of analysis, they should respond. That's why I respect the presidency. Few months ago, we, about, the Nigerian government received $311 million from Jesse and the U.S. government mm -hmm. as the Abasha 4. What we refer to the Abasha 4. You know, we have Abasha 1, Abasha 2, Abasha 3, mm -hmm. Abasha 4. So this $311 million in the agreement with the U.S. government and Jesse government, they agreed that the money will be used for three major projects. One of those projects is Abuja, Kaduna Road, Ibadan, Lagos Road. And the third one was the second Niger Bridge. These were the three projects. And I was party in all this process. I've been watching it right from Washington down to Nigeria. When the agreement was signed, it was only three projects that was agreed that the money will be used for. And the Nigerian Social Investment Company will be used as a vehicle to implement this project. But what happened? We suddenly got a news press release from Shew, the man piece of the presidency, saying that we're going to use it for this three projects and other projects. That's Mr. Gaba Shew. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And as civil society, we all know very well, we issue out a press statement saying what he has said is wrong, it's not true. But you see, what really was very interesting in that exchange was how the presidency now responded to say publicly in an, a press statement issue out that yes, they were wrong and that it was actually for those three projects. That's how you make a society to work. And we must commend the presidency for doing that. And we also went back to say that, and that's what I'm saying publicly to say, that's how government is run. But unfortunately, the way government is run in this part of the world, sometimes people who support government feel that anytime you raise questions, you must be persecuted, you must be executed, you must be killed. Unfortunately, nobody stays in government for life. If you're a governor today, you'll be former governor in the next future. There's one very prominent political leaders. They, they pay a price for what? There are people who have died in this state, sometimes because of lack of uh, oxygen. So anything, and you can see what COVID-19 have also showed that has provided a lovely fleet for both the rich and the poor. And the rich are not able to fly to London to take treatment again. And so they have not seen how they have underdeveloped our health centers across the country. And they are paying a price for it. They are paying a price for it. There, so, there are policy experts who, who, who say uh, if, we must, if we must move forward, if we yeah. must tackle poverty reasonably, we, yes. we have to downplay politicking and be able to amplify governance. I mean, uh, there are policies around know, governance. Yes, but, yeah. but, but, but how, how do we make governance more of the issue uh, instead of partisanship? It's, it's what, you know what it is mm. for ITV to allocate more than 20, 30 minutes discussing governance issue? Yeah. That's investment. Mm. We must thank the ITV management. They could have sold this airtime. I know what it is because we bought the airtime in ITV. I know what it costs. So if you look what ITV is doing with their TMI, you see what ITV is doing with a man around talk, you, can you quantify? So it, it, can you, in a decent society, ITV deserve a palliative. COVID-19 or no COVID-19? <laughs> the those state government and federal government should, should uh, that's what they call tax exemption to grow business. Do you know that within this period of COVID, ITV in terms of growth, in terms of resources, would have declined. But do they, did they also draw down their public uh, debate uh, programs? No. Do you know what this public discussion contributes in, in uniting society, in providing perspective for society? In decent developing country, where government work, organizations like ITV will be given some benefit in terms of tax support, exemption. Because within this period of COVID, what can ITV say as a private business entity benefited from government? The whole reason behind, behind social investment is that there are certain poor. It's to avoid we don't leave anyone behind. In America, as we speak now, the businesses, both the small and medium enterprises, are getting benefit from their government. But the political elite in Africa, in Nigeria in particular, they don't think like this. Because if ITV go down, 
if they are not able to survive because of this COVID-19, it will undermine the economy of Edo State. It will undermine. So what we would like to be hearing from the election politics here and there is what can government do to address post-COVID-19? Mm. The small medium enterprises, those small women that are selling things in the market, what is government going to do? We, we should not just have government that is just collecting tasks, grab, 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 grab. What are they doing? And I would like to see that in their billboard. You know, this big board we see across the state now. We want to see what government, you and I as a citizen, the poor, this is what we will do. For example, in a do state, the 100% of people that are poor, if I become a governor or if I become so, 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 I will reduce it to 20, 30%. You know, those are the kind of things we want to see. And that's what we want to see in Nigeria. Um, but for validating those data, independent body like ITV, Anedge, we should begin to work together. And that's why I saw this opportunity of coming to provide an intellectual analysis behind the social investment program as a time, timely intervention. Because it does help to again send a strong signal. Because we are not, I'm not a revolutionist. I don't believe in destroying the old system before you can have a headway. Lesson from Tunisia is very clear. Lesson from Iraq is very clear. You don't need to collapse the entire system. Nobody is perfect. Either the government is not perfect. And as from my own religious perspective, who have not seen should cast the first stone. Mm. So all this analysis we are running, we're not saying that Buhari is finished. No, we're not saying, no. Can we find a way to help address some of the problems? Now, now, now that you have mentioned data, let's uh, wind down uh, on that note. Uh, Nigeria is said by many to be a data, uh, data poor culture, I mean, to have a data poor culture. Yes. Uh, up until today, uh, many Nigerians don't have national ID card. <laughs> it has become luxury. And they have those it's, who are brandishing. It's, de it's deliberate. Who are, who are brandishing it's, it's the deliberate. so called temporary yes. uh, 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 ID card, national yes. ID card. And we have instances where you have been issued a temporary card, which is, of course, on the, the same thing with the a driving paper. license. Yes, and you are asked to go laminate by yourself or maybe someone uh, in, in, in the office there. Uh, pledges to say, okay, I could laminate for you, and then you pay a certain amount, and so on and so forth. These are systemic issues. Two years ago, for example, the DG of the NIMC mentioned a certain amount it will cost the agency to provide ID cards for one million Nigerians. It was whooping. And then you're asking, how much will it then cost to provide ID cards for about 200 million Nigerians. So, so it, 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 it gives the impression That's that... That's the politics. It gives the impression that... That's the politics of poverty. There's, there's a glass ceiling <laughs> above our heads as far as development is concerned, yes. particularly in the area of uh, having a data-driven system. How mm. do we deal with data? I must... Look, I must commend a do state government. Mm. A do state government is number one. In terms of data collection? Yeah, in terms of... In terms of okay. moving the do state government, either their budget, mm. if you go to their website, you will be impressed the kind of data you find there mm. in terms of contract a dusty government number one even the world bank have also adjoined that that the dusty government is doing excellently well in data mm. and i'm very impressed that the state governor was saying recently i will make sure that the fiber office becomes a a a, a big thing in a dusty mm. you know what that means people like us who are looking to see how a dusty can become a hub for startup mm. we are encouraged because the future economy is not oil. Right. The future economy is data. So if a dual state government can make it possible for every poor person in a, in a dual state to have access to data, internet, that will be a big boost to the economy of a dual state. Because the future economy is the internet economy. Mm -hmm. the, the divide today, the COVID-19 crisis have shown that if we don't address the issue of access to internet, the inequality, the, the difference it's between the rich and the poor up. is widening up. Mm. Because the rich male children, as we speak, are going to school through online. The poor male children in Igobazua, in Okada, may, may in Ugo Bridge, the they don't have access to internet. Mm. So where I heard from that Governor Baseki was going to make sure that access to internet in a those state will become something that is accessible, mm. I give him the answer. Right, so, so that, that sounds like we should be looking forward to broadband internet, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. especially for those who are based in those states uh, mm -hmm. anytime soon. Reverend David Ugolo, Executive Director, African Network for Economic and Environmental Justice. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank program. you. Man. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. All right, we'll take a break at this point. We're back shortly to put the icing on the cake for you on the program. Stay with us.